All right. Hello. So for, this is for my criminology class. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have never seen me before because you're in your, the online class, hello. Um, but uh, I just sort of wanted to explain this a little bit. It's just much easier to, for me to talk about it than to try to type out all the information or put it on the PowerPoint. Um, so I thought this was the easiest way to do this for this section of the, uh, the material this week, especially because it did not um, go over this in the book. So these are sort of some of the um, topologies that I added in, uh, it being my area of research. Uh, so um, I just wanted to go over uh, Gross topology and the Knight and Prentice topology so that you have a little bit more background on that and so you kind of know more about it. So we'll start with Gross rapist topology. So this is what it looks like. Um, so Gross came up with this in 1979. Um, he had the three major types, the anger rapist, the power rapist, and the sadistic rapist. Uh, and these subtypes are based on criminal behavior, but also on their main motivations for committing their crimes. So not all individuals are gonna fall neatly into one of these categories necessarily. You might have an offender that displays characteristics or motivations from other subtypes, but they're going to have, typically have one that's kind of their predominant defining feature based on um, their, their motivation and based on their behavior. Uh, and you do have some purists as well that would, that would fit right into one of these categories. So start talking about the anger rapist first. So the anger rapist expresses anger and hostility. So that's why we call it the anger rapist. And so they have the, they've had this buildup of this emotion and they're expressing this anger and this hostility towards society, towards specific subgroups. It can vary, but they're just angry people. And they typically have violent relationships in their life. Um, and so they, they displace this hostility and resentment on their victims. So because of the, the violence in the relationships that they have outside of the context of the crime, it's going to affect how they then behave within the context of the crime. So the crime itself, there's going to be excessive force. Uh, it, they're going to be physically and verbally aggressive. There's going to be physical injury to the victim, potentially humiliation techniques as well. And it's going to be a very spontaneous and impulsive crime. Uh, because typically um, there's some kind of precipitating life stressor usually uh, and so something just bad will tip them off and then they're just going to go off in a rage basically. Um, so that's the anger rapist. Again, just the purist. It doesn't, somebody could have some of those traits but not all of those traits and sort of be partway in between anger and one of the other categories potentially. So then we move on to the power rapist. So the power rapist, just like what the name suggests, they want to have power and control. They want to control their victims. They see their victims as a possession. And so this is typically the, 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 um, the guys, and I say guys because over 99% of rapists are male. Um, so doesn't mean that women can't rape, but predominantly we're talking about males. So um, these guys, they're going to have these feelings of inadequacy in their, their other aspects of their lives. They're going to feel they're controlled by other people. They're insecure about their masculinity, typically. And so they then use rape to feel more powerful, to feel stronger, and to sort of make up for these inadequacies in other aspects of their lives. So these crimes are going to have a lot more planning and premeditation because they're going to want vulnerable, easy targets. The last thing these guys want is for their victim to sort of just be able to either fight back or get away or ruin their plan. So they want an easy target because they want to easily take control and have their have no risk uh, of losing that control because they need it. So often um, these are these crimes will be triggered by some kind of threat to their competency or to their masculinity. So you know somebody calling him a uh, you know a pansy or um, especially if it comes from the victim, you know, maybe a woman saying, oh, you know, you're not much of a man or something like that. That'll sort of trigger that, that response that they feel they need to then prove themselves, whether to themselves or they have to prove themselves to the other person. But either way, they, that threat to their masculinity can be a precipitating factor for these crimes. And then we have our sadistic rapists. And our sadistic rapists are the most dangerous. And the reason for this is that sadism means that somebody has a sexual arousal to uh, injuring and harming other people. 
And so sadistic rapists, then they literally get their pleasure and their excitement, including that sexual arousal, from the infliction of harm. And so they enjoy the victim's fear, they enjoy the victim's suffering, and so of course that's going to be a very volatile situation, very dangerous situation for the victim. And so they're, they're, it's going to be extremely abusive uh, crime, they're going to use restraints, they're going to torture their victim, they're going to mutilate their victim, they're also the most likely to kill their victims. And so there's also going to be considerable planning and premeditation, even more so than our power rapists. Um, because they have a specific fantasy that they're playing out, typically. And so they're going to target their victims, they're going to stalk their victims often. Uh, they want specific traits in their victims because they're fulfilling a fantasy. So they have to look a certain way so that they fulfill that fantasy. Or maybe they have to, you know, resemble their mother or um, whether we're talking about looks or behavioral uh, patterns. But th there's going to be some kind of traits that they're looking for in order to fulfill that fantasy. So, <clears throat> so again, you, you can have overlap. You can have somebody that has, maybe they're pri primarily sadistic, but maybe they're also looking for power. Um, maybe they're power rapists, but they also have anger issues. There can be overlap. Maybe they have elements of all three, but which is why I've got sort of the Venn diagram to describe this. But you do have rapists that will fit um, into, into those categories as well. Alright, so that's gross rapist pathology. So then we have Knight and Prentice. So Knight and Prentice, and it's, uh, this was, it came out in 1990, but the reason that it's called the MTCR3 is just about where the sample came from. So the sample was from the Massachusetts Treatment Center, and it's the rapist pathology. it's just the third version of it. So that's all that that means. Um, but this was an amazing sample that they used to come up with this topology, and um, it was a sample of 254, which is really big for rapists because rapists are relatively rare, which is a great thing. But um, when it comes to doing research, that means that it's hard to get some good samples. So having a sample of 254, that's that's really good. So they could do a lot with that. So here's what their um, the MTCR3 looks like. And so the the first sort of the way that you read this is you have the primary motivation kind of along the top. And so that's either opportunistic, pervasively angry, sexual, or vindictive. And so it's, that's kind of the main axis, and that is the motive that is characterizing the overall offense. So those are really our predominant types. And then you have some other discriminatory dimensions underneath that, which we'll get to um, in a minute. But so let's just talk about the primary motivations first. So we have the opportunistic rapist. The opportunistic rapist, it's like what it sounds like. It, they're looking for an opportunity. And um, so sometimes they can create their own opportunities, but sometimes they just sort of take advantage of what comes up, but that their motivation is just opportunity. So these will typically be generalists uh, because they sort of take advantage of opportunities in general. So they'll take, an, take advantage to, of an opportunity to steal something from somebody uh, or to break into a house or to rape somebody. And it's all just kind of whatever opportunities present themselves. Not necessarily generalists, but they, you would see a lot more generalists in that category compared to our specialists. Uh, and then we have the pervasively angry. So the pervasively angry offenders, these just like what it sound like, they are very angry. Very similar to the anger rapists from the Gross, from Gross topology, where they just are sort of angry at life and they often have uh, violent relationships in their life and they're, there's going to be anger and hostility in the crime, there's going to be a lot of force, they're going to be aggressive and abusive, and um, so that's what, it's very similar to Groff's anger rapist. Then we have our sexual motivations, and so this, these are the offenders that their main motivation is sex. That's, that's the reason that they rape. And um, there are some people that will argue that all rape is about power, but that's not true. You do have groups of rapists where literally their motivation is sex. They want sex. And this is the way that they do it. Either they uh, prefer rape to consensual sex, and that's more arousing for them. Often those are the ones going to be more likely to fall into the sadistic subcategory. But you also just have, they want sex, and they don't care how they get it. Yeah, it'd be nice if a woman said yes, but that's not necessary. But they really they really need that sex. So, but sex would be the primary motivation. So that's the, that's the focus. Which means that these crimes are not going to be as... Uh, violent when we're talking about the non-sadistic subtypes. So 
the sadistic subtype is very similar to Groff's sadistic subtype, where they're, it's the motivation is sexual, but it's sadistic sexual. So there will be a lot of violence and, and abuse, and um, because again, the sadism means that they're getting that sexual arousal from injuring the victim and from the victim's harm and suffering. So you will, it, those will be dangerous situations. But the non-sadistic sexual, that's literally that they, they want sex and they don't really care how they get it. And so it, you're not going to see as much overt violence there. They're just trying to get um, somebody to comply enough so that they can complete their sexual assault. So, but they're, but they're just horny and they want to get sex and that's the way that they're going about it. But there'd be more, there'd be a lot more planning with those types of crimes compared to the pure opportunistic where there'd be very little, no planning at all. And then we have our vindictive type, and the vindictive rapists are actually somewhat similar to the pervasively angry uh, in terms of sort of how their, what their life kind of might look like and what the crime kind of might look like. But the big difference is that the vindictive rapists, their anger is directed specifically towards women. So that means that in their life, um, maybe there was abuse, but it was specifically perpetrated by mom or they don't have, they never had that maternal figure in their life at all. And so they're missing, so they have a lot of mommy issues. And so they're missing that, uh, that, uh, that early attachment. And so that's kind of what might have caused it for some of these, for some of these guys, um, that hatred towards women. So they hate women. They feel like women are less than, and they feel that women should be punished. And this is how they're going about doing that. So, um, so again, you're going to have pretty brutal crimes for some of these because they just want to punish women and this is the way that they're doing it. And so we do have some other discriminatory dimensions here. So um, so we do have the, the different levels of social competence. So for example, we look at the opportunistic and you have high versus low social competence. And this just means that with under, within, under the, the sort of a, the idea of the opportunistic, you also, you have the guys that are, um, they're charming and you know they can probably convince people to uh convince their victims uh to you know, go with them somewhere or something like that or, or they, they have a certain amount of charm uh and then they end up raping the victim anyways but so so they might be more likely to be able to create their own opportunity uh when they see the when they see the opening versus the low social competence uh where that group is still opportunistic but they're kind of the more weird awkward probably creepy guys and so they, their opportunity might look like something like an, um, a heavily intoxicated victim or somebody who's passed out. Those would be the more opportunities that those guys would take advantage of. So we also have the different levels of social competence that you see fall under, um, like under the non-sadistic, uh, sexual, and also the vindictive. And so that just sort of, it tells you different kinds of types within that group. But, but the main focus, the main uh, discriminatory uh, focus that we're, folk that we're looking at here is the opportunistic versus pervasively angry versus sexual and within the sexual is sadistic versus non-sadistic that's an important dimension and then the vindictive and so another really interesting thing about um, the knight and crunchy topology is that when you look at the types along the bottom the types one through nine uh, they're actually arranged so that they're ones that are juxtaposed to each other are more alike than the ones that are more distal so for example type one and two are very similar but also type two would be more like type three than type seven or eight uh, and that's in terms of, you know, what their life looks like, how they behave, uh, what the crime looks like, their MO, what the victim choices, all those sort of factors taken into consideration. The ones that are closer together are more similar than the ones more distal. So that's just an interesting, uh, really, really brilliant, uh, the brilliant topology that Knight and Crunchy came up with. And that was just one element of that brilliance. Um, <clears throat> so that uh, is kind of, the, in a nutshell, the, uh, the two major topologies within um, the rapist, rape literature. And so when we're talking about rapists, those are some of the major topologies. So um, yeah, so if you have any questions about this, if you want more explanation about this or anything um, from your notes, just ask and hopefully this helps make some of this more clear.